I'm sure one thing you felt as Doug was reading that is that you are glad you're not reading all the names in that text. Because there's a load of them. But I hope you saw, and I think we're going to look at this morning, that endings and closings, goodbyes, conclusions are important. First time I ever went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan was in the middle of December. Not a recommended time to visit that part of the country. I at one point asked my friend from college, we were going up to visit his family, to literally stop the car because I got out of his car and at my six foot four height could not see above the snow plowed along the edge of the road. It looked like we were in this, in this extended tunnel. You could only see the heavens above, but I couldn't see if there was a house or a farm field or whatever because it was just literally something close to seven feet of snow on each side of the road. Never had I seen that. We get there late at night because we left on an a- at, at the middle of the afternoon. I didn't even meet his dad. His mom was there to greet us and to give us a little bit of food, but we were tired. We went to bed, and I was awoken early in the morning when it was still dark by Mr. Brood. It was the last name, the surname of the family I was with, shaking me in the shoulder, and he's like, you ready to get up? We, the, the cows are hungry, and we got to do some milking. And I'm like, oh, you want me to do that? He's like, oh, do you want to eat today too? So I, he said, I brought you some stuff because it's cold out there. And I stood up, and this five foot seven Mr. Brood is like, oh, I don't have a big enough coat. But he found me something to wrap around myself, and I went out into the barn and worked with the broods before we came into a, a good, warm farming breakfast early in the morning. And I spent the weekend with this sweet family. And I'll tell you, I, I don't remember all the food we ate. I don't remember all the games or the conversation. But here's one thing that sticks in my mind. As we were going to leave, their son and I to drive back down to Chicago area to go back to college. I was about to walk out the door, and Mr. Brew just grabbed me and said, no, 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 we, we, we kind of closed together in prayer before a departure, and we kind of got around right by the front door, and there was the two sisters of my friend and my friend and his mom and dad, and they kind of circled up, and I, I just didn't know the procedure. Mr. Brood grabs my shoulder, pulls me forward, and we all grabbed hands, and we stood in this circle, and then they just prayed, and it wasn't just a little short little thing. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just about safety. It was literally, the pe- they were praying for us as we departed. I'll never forget Mr. Brood, never, never himself having gone off to college, but he was praying specifically for his son and for me, and he specifically mentioned my name and prayed that I would faithfully study hard, that I would not be lazy, that I would work, that the Lord would use my studies, even that particular semester, for the purposes that he would have. And I was just so overwhelmed by the beauty and the power of that goodbye that that sticks in my memory the most. Beyond the piles of snow and the fun fellowship of this sweet Christian family way in the northern part of this great country, I remember that goodbye. I learned a lot about that family and that man that weekend, but that that closing said a lot. And I want to tell you, it'd be real easy as we're working expositorily through God's Word to come to the end of 2 Timothy to see a bunch of names that nobody wants to have to pronounce in public. And just to think that it's just a bunch of goodbyes and conclusions and to miss the kind of thing that I experienced with the Brood family in the UP of Michigan. Paul tells us a lot here about himself about ministry, about struggles, about brothers and sisters upon whom he relies, upon the work of God, about feeding of bitterness, but God's gracious work and strengthening. There's a whole lot here in this one goodbye that we don't want to miss. So we're going to look at these, but before we do, let me, let me ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. Father, help us to hear your word this morning. Help it to form us and shape us to teach and rebuke as needed so that the ministry of your Spirit could continue through your sacred holy word. Help us to hear, help our hearts to be softened, help our minds to be attentive to the truth that you want to give. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Now, one thing I just want to say is, just by, by way of information, is Paul gives a very traditional closing to his letter here in 2 Timothy. This is kind of what they would look like. There would be some reminiscing, some reflections, some send greetings to so-and-so, certain updates, even of a personal nature that would regularly happen. In fact, letters in the ancient world were extremely flexible. In, in fact, as long as there was an intro and a conclusion, you could have anything in between, and it was a letter. Now, one, one interesting fact is most letters in the ancient world were actually quite short. We've got several hundred on record, not just of Christian letters, but, but, but any kind of secular letters from the ancient world. The average length, if you put all those letters together and divide them by the number of letters, the average length of those letters was about 87 words. Second uh, Timothy has just about 1,600. Now, now think about Romans as a letter or 1 Corinthians as a letter. See, those would be huge. But we can almost forget because of the length and because of their theological and ministerial nature that th that is some person writing to some people. In fact, it's good for us to remember that letters are situational. They're, they're written to address particular situations. And that the New Testament letters are authoritative substitutes for Paul's apostolic presence. Like if Paul could have been there with 2 Timothy, or with Timothy, instead of writing 2 Timothy, this is what he would have said. If he could have been there, he would have, he would have talked to people and thanked them or prayed with them. And he's having to do that in letter form. That means they're never meant to be exhaustive dictionaries of Christian doctrine. They don't address every situation. Through these letters, early Christian leadership was able to address particular issues in the church. That means they're applied theology. And in God's providence... We can apply them to our life and our ministry as part of God's canonical word, the Old and the New Testaments. And when we look at these verses, we can see that the closing of 2 Timothy gives us five important insights into Christian ministry. Now, before, before I say that, I don't want you to kind of zone out because when you think of Christian ministry, you think of what our tradition has inappropriately done is it's professionalized everything. It's all professionalized. We, you, you pay people to do Christian ministry. I will say that is not the case. Christian ministry is what the church, the whole church, is assigned to do. That just as the whole church receives Jesus as their Savior, so the whole church obeys him as their Lord. And, and, a, and, a, and a text that we've used several times in recent years has been Ephesians 4.12, which explicitly says that those pastors and elders and teachers who God has assigned to care for you and shepherd you and raise you up in the faith are doing so so that you, the people of God, can do the work of ministry. Like we want to be in Ephesians 4.12 church because that's what Christianity looks like. But we, for various reasons, we've professionalized it, uh, maybe because we're just good consumers, we forget that we're also supposed to be contributors. Maybe kind of in the modern world, just the programmatic nature of church, which just is bringing all these kind of things in from, from, from the world. Maybe those are the kind of reasons why we have forgotten that church is not some of just the institutional things like this gathering, but those organic hundreds of little touches where you are doing the work of the saints, the ministry with God's people. So when you think of it from that perspective, when you don't professionalize ministry, but you personalize it, what the Lord wants me to do. He may not want me to read very difficult names, and you're like, amen, that's not for me. All right, we won't ask you to do that. But I guarantee you, if he can save you, then he can have you serve. In fact, if a disciple is not in some way serving as much as they're feeding, something's wrong. Like their discipleship is off. Like they got really, really good understanding of the Jesus as Savior, but they have not understood that he is Lord. Again, remember Mr. Brood? Oh, you want me to help, I said? <laughs> what, what did he think of that 20-year-old boy? Oh, 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 oh you want to eat breakfast? Well, yeah, I want you to help. We just got to find a coat that fits. He just assumed if I'm going to be in his house in one of his beds, in one of his chairs, then I'm going to be with one of his cows. That's just kind of how it works. In fact, if you look at a healthy family just in the world, you would, just, you would see that, oh, not just moms and dads. They're not just housekeepers. The whole family is participating in the family life. 
so too the church. So let's look at Christian ministry from that perspective. Ephesians 4.12, Christian ministry. And let's look at the five things, the insights Paul gives in regard to it. First is this, ministry is a team effort. You, you can just see this in verses 9 through 12. Ministry is a team effort filled with personal and relational challenges and blessings. Notice how Paul starts. Do your best to come to me soon. He needs help, or he's lonely, or he needs items that he'll mention in verse 13. He needs co-workers. What, a, what an important statement that we might just breeze past if we're not thinking of the Apostle Paul himself needing people. He's no superhero. This isn't like the Avengers. This is reality where we all need people. We are made to need helpers and assistants, and leaders, and brothers, and sisters. We need that. We, we need this every day in almost every way. So too the church. Lone Rangers are a fiction. Paul's words reveal how even he needed people. Look what he goes on to say. He, he talks about, in verse 10, about someone leaving him, deserting him. And sometimes that people do that. They leave for sinful reasons. And it hurts relationally. It hurts ministerially. But people who labor with us are a gift. Look at verse 10. For Demas, and look at this qualification, in love with this present world, what does that mean? How would you like that to be in the eternal word of God which gets read publicly for two millennia in every church around the world in every kind of language? That's what you're known for. I don't know much about him, but he's in love with this world. It means something like this, right? He was so into the reality of this world, possessions, his relationships, his loves, his kids, his grandkids, his income, his retirement, his hobbies. He was so in love with this world that he failed to minister in a way that was working for the world to come. Oh, may that not be us. As Paul says about Damas, he's deserted me gone to Thessalonica. Then he mentions others about whom, by the way, several of these names, we don't have much information. Like, we don't know. It's not like there's a record. Remember, this is a situational communication. Paul and arguably Timothy or maybe in those church, they knew these core leaders. They left us. Why'd they go? We're sad to lose them. Aren't they, aren't, aren't they interested in the work of the gospel? I could use their help. They were so gifted at this. Why are they gone? Sometimes that happens. And it hurts. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Then verse 11, Luke alone is with me. Good on Luke. You can just imagine that when Paul wrote those words at the beginning of verse 11, that he was more than a little thankful for that brother. And remember that. When there's people in your life that stick with you, walk with you, love, tell them. Paul needs more. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Just look at how the Apostle Paul, this obviously gifted, talented minister, missionary, pastor, theologian, is craving the ministry support of others. There are no Lone Rangers. This is done by a family. Look at verse 13. Again, this might be a verse we would just breeze right past. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books. That's one of my favorite verses. Bring the books. And above all, the parchments, papers, documents. You know what this teaches us if we just look carefully at this? Ministry happens through ordinary means. Paul wants his cloak. You might almost translate that as a coat, except it would have been this big piece of fabric with a hole through the top so his head could go through that also functioned almost like a blanket. Oftentimes, most likely on his missionary journeys, he would sleep using that cloak as like a blanket to warm him. He wants his books. He wants his papers. 
the, the, the mentioning of the books reminds us that we're people of the book. God's word is significant to us. We're, we're not all scholars, and praise God for that, actually. But ideas do matter. Truth matters. But even the fact that he wants his papers, wants his documents, were they his notes? Had he been, was it a partial letter he's writing to another church that would later show up in our New Testament? What is his, was it his legal papers? Because trying to be a Roman citizen, dealing with issues of arrest and imprisonment, he needed those documents? We don't know. But it happens through ordinary means. We can lose that. We, we can think it's got to be bigger and better. We, we can make it about Hollywood or the newest ride at Disney World and miss that actually God works through the simple things. I remember the first time my boys, I don't know if Ruthie was old enough yet, but we watched the, like one of the early Star Wars, and it just looks cheesy to people with you know, graphic awareness now. They're like, what? They would just giggle and laugh at the sound effects or the computer graphics compared to what it is now. And at one point, one of my boys goes, Dad, you're, you're kind of old. Like, it's way better now. I said, okay, this is like late 70s, early 80s. Give it a break, boys. But we're used to something bigger. We advanced beyond. It's got to be bigger. It's got to be better. I'm thinking of a church in Southern California, right? How, how do you compete in Southern California as a church? You got to up it, man. You got to up it sound system and chairs recline, maybe massage you during the service. You got to have the big bang. I mean, churches have slides going down for don't get any ideas, kids. Slides going down. How about this Easter helicopter flying over the church yard as they're dropping eggs with candy until one year when one kid got hit right in the eyeball. 30,000 eggs dropping from a helicopter. 20-some thousand people would come to participate. How do you up that? An astronaut dropping something from outer space? The professional sports team coming? Because you got to have big names and big bangs to get this to happen. You know what verse 13 reminds us? God works through ordinary means. He works in the little small churches with little sweet saints who will declare the truth of God, and the Spirit takes that, and boom, makes it work in our lives. And there was no helicopter involved. It doesn't always need to be bigger and better. When, when, we, when we act that way or assume that way, we're just importing from our secular world those ideas and thinking we have to implement those in the church. God works through ordinary means. And most likely, all of you would say it wasn't a helicopter or having Tim Tebow come and talk to the church, or whatever it may be, you know what it was? It was a sweet saint that nobody else will even know. Maybe even, talk about ordinary, maybe even a loving mom or dad, or a committed grandpa or grandma, or an aunt and uncle, who nobody else know, but in God's beautiful providence, through the most ordinary means, you heard the gospel. Because God's like, I don't need a show, I got the Spirit. And I don't need to win you. I need to resurrect you from the dead by the truth of Jesus Christ. Now you look at verses 14 and 16, and here Paul gets a bit more personal. I'm, I'm going to summarize them, and then we'll look at those words. But Paul says some people in ministry, some, some people in ministry sin, hurt others, damage the church, and even leave the faith. He mentions a guy named, verse 14, named Alexander the coppersmith. He worked with metal. Think of like a blacksmith of some sort. And look what he says. He did me great harm. We don't know exactly what he did, but we get a sense in verse 16 when Paul says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me. Some think that maybe Alexander the coppersmith helped get Paul arrested, which tried to thwart his ministry to preach the gospel. We don't know that. I and mean, that's just a read between the lines. He did me great harm. Look, look at what Paul says in the end of 14. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. 
You do not want those words said about you. Paul even warns us, beware of Alexander the coppersmith, beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At first, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. And then he says this phrase, may it, may it not be charged against them. Like he understood maybe the persecution, the threat of arrest, losing income, the public shame in a pagan, secular culture. He can understand why you'd be a little scared to stand next to Paul. That happens in ministry. Sometimes people who we thought were with us or for us, meaning we thought they were believers, actually hurt the ministry specifically. I remember I was worked at a summer camp. I got recruited to be a camp counselor at, at the end of my freshman year in college, went up to this camp in Lower Peninsula, Michigan, at a camp about half the size of a Timberley, so smaller camp, and I loved it. Was a great program director there, and he had a great program. He invested in me as a person, and I loved working with the kids of all ages. Came back after my sophomore year, same thing. Junior year, this guy asked me to be his assistant. So I was the assistant program director, and even though I missed being with the kids more, I enjoyed investing in the counselors, learning some of the leadership and organization, administration, and serving in that capacity, teaching more regularly as I was nearing the end of college. But I thought I was done. I would graduate that next year. I was going on to seminary in a different state. The camp director called me and said, our program director is, is no longer there. I need you. I said, I, I don't think I'm your guy. Like, well, I, I got nobody for this summer. So I said, I'll do it this summer while you do a full search. So I wrote the entire curriculum for all the campers coming through. I hired all these counseling staff while I was in my last semester of college and simultaneously trying to trying to court this very sweet brunette named Laura. I show up at the camp. I'm ready to go. I go. I know there's all these files. We've got camp maps and things that we've used for years. I knew exactly where they were. I'd been at the camp for three years. I show up, open up these filing cabinets, and everything is gone. This is like pre-technology, right? There's not all these laptops and computers. This is, this is, we've got stuff going back to the 70s and 80s. There, there aren't computers with all these documents saved. These are old photocopies and the whole thing's empty. So I run to the director of the campus and say, hey, where'd you guys move the files? He's like, move what files? We didn't, we don't touch anything in the program director's office. I, I come to find out that the, the, the former program director took everything with him. Like even maps of a camp that you would never use except where? At the camp. He didn't just photocopy them, which he had the full right to do. He actually took them and claimed they were his own possession. So I call him. I mean, this man had invested in me for many years. I considered him a brother, not just a co-worker. To me, he was an older brother. He had finished an MDiv at our denomination seminary, Trinity. I said, hey, I can't. I assumed it was a mistake. Like, I totally thought it was a mistake. I said, Hey, man, where, where, where'd, you, where'd you move all the files? They, they, they've been there all these years. Oh, they're in my home here, in my state. He lives in a different state. I said, well, I, I need those big time. Like, can, did, did somebody just put them in a box for you? Ship them to me. He's like, oh, no, I'm not giving them back. I'm not sure they're just yours. Oh, they're mine. In fact, I was waiting to call. I, while you were here, I got my lawyer on the line. He's here to answer any questions. I said, lawyer, what do you need a map of the camp for? Like, we use that every year. He's like, well, if you have any questions, you can talk to my lawyer. So I hung up that phone, and I kind of put my head in my hands, and I said, Lord, we were already starting a bit behind the eight ball, and now we have to recreate all these documents and we've got three, week, three weeks. And it was a horrific, horrific experience. And I, I was deeply hurt personally by that individual. Because it didn't feel like his gripe with the camp or the director was one thing. He didn't care about me or the hundreds of campers who were coming through for gospel ministry. Now what does Paul teach us about that? 
Well, he tells us it's going to happen. There's Alexander the coppersmith in other places who, for whatever reason, sin against their brothers and sisters and against the Lord. He teaches us that the Lord will repay according to their deeds. But he, what he says at the end is interesting. Even those that have hurt him, wounded him, he says, may it not be charged against them. That was not me. In that moment, I wanted to drive to this other Midwestern state and have a personal conversation. His lawyer could be there if he wanted to. I wanted to have a little bit of a personal conversation with this guy that's probably half my size. That wasn't right either. That's just, that's my flesh speaking. Through Paul, the Lord is teaching us to wear spectacles of both grace and hope. Since people are sinful, hurtful, and selfish, grace helps us see everyone as a work in progress. Even that brother of mine, he's a work in progress. He sinned against me, against that camp, against hundreds of kids that came that summer, against staff, volunteers who had to do extra work while he had all that we needed sitting in a box in his garage. But grace sees that everyone is a work in progress, and the Lord is the one that deals with them. But since God is sovereign and can use even evil for good, hope sees everything as directed by God's purposes. I grew immensely in that moment. I learned a whole lot that summer. Things that I may not have learned, had not have learned if I hadn't gone through that myself. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Even to this day, thinking about this story this week, I still can't even fathom that. His gripe wasn't with me. He was trying to hurt the camp director. What he did is hurt everybody else. In verses 17 and 18, and, and maybe it needs to be said after all of this people leaving, etc., and even what we're talking about, look what Paul says. And every time you see a but, but the Lord, that conjunction, all the kids who, who have yet to start school are like, please don't mention grammar. But man, those conjunctions in the Bible are beautiful. You know why? Because you hear about this abandonment and left alone, and then Paul says, but the Lord. And you know how many times we could go and circle, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God. We didn't look bad, but God. But the Lord stood by me. I'm thinking of that phrase. I'm thinking of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And now the Apostle Paul. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Demas deserted. Alexander betrayed, but not the Lord. The Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. In fact, 17 could be even trying to say that literally what they intended for evil, putting me in places and in, in company I would have never thought, God used that to proclaim the gospel to people that would have never heard it. I love the end of 17. And if you remember the illusion. Kids, you know where this is from? So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me. Here's, here Paul now in 18 gives the bigger picture. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. And he gets so excited he has to do a little doxology. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You see... You might be thinking, how am I, I mean, I hear your call, like I like the Ephesians 4.12 and the work of the saints, but I'm not sure I have anything to bring. I don't know what role I'm supposed to have. Verse 18, the Lord himself is the true source and sustenance of ministry. God is the one who works through us and simultaneously in us, which is the most amazing of things. Last Lee, verses 19 to 22, with a bunch of names we never have to read out loud. The Lord uses every kind of person to do the work of ministry. Kids, hear this. I, I want you to hear this. 
Because I think it's easy for kids to think maybe on Sunday morning it's really for my dad, like the pastor talking, and there's words I don't know. And, 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 but it's for all of us. L let, me, let me show you how. Ministry involves not just men, but women. Notice verse 19, greet Prisca and Aquila. And I want to tell you something shocking. In the ancient world, the ordering of the names was always the one higher rank. I mean, that is almost universal in this highly patriarchal culture and, and, and structure. And yet several times, this being one of them, the wife, Priscilla, here Paul gives her kind of shortened name, like calling somebody Kim, who's Kimberly. Prisca is named first. That should teach the church a lot. God uses every person. How about this one, kids? End of verse 19. And the household of Onesiphorus. It doesn't say, and the parents only. It says the household. It says the whole family. It says the little kids. You may be too small to even carry the chairs if we're setting something up with chairs, but I bet you can pick up the trash on the floor. I bet you can help them serve in other ways. Just as in a healthy family, we're all jumping in, so too, and a healthy church family, we're all trying to serve. Vera made a plug to our teens to help in something like Awana. You don't realize, teens, because you still feel young or you see these kind of annoying little kids, how much just six, seven years makes a difference in how they look up to you. My son last year was working with Awana. I'd walk in, pick him up. Kid looks right past me and goes, Ben! It's like he was a celebrity because of little boys. See, uh, at that point, a 13-year-old who's like a superhero to them. Ministry involves the strong and the weak. I don't know what the ailment is, but notice what it says in verse 20. Paul had to leave Trophimus, who was ill. But ministry involves not just the strong but even the weak, those that have less energy or tired, those are limited in certain ways. Maybe we can't be moving the chairs. We can pray. We can write notes. We can help cut out crafts. We can do a whole lot of things. And last, ministry involves staff and even lay ministers. He mentions some names in verses 20 and 21, like one is Erastus, and we don't know much about him, but we do know that he was a city administrator, maybe like a mayor, a governor of some sort. And then Linus is mentioned, who we believe was the first bishop of the city of Rome. So ministry involves not just staff ministers, but even lay people in the community serving and ministering together. So you're not standing with the Brood family. You're sitting around the Apostle Paul when he gathers all these people by name in his letter. He's got Timothy. He's got Erastus. He's got Luke. He's thinking of Mark. He's got Linus. He's got Trophimus, who's sick. And he gathers them around, and he's talking about the work of ministry. And like with that Brood family and that doorstep, in the UP of Michigan, you learn a lot about somebody by a closing. You learn a lot about a family by how they say goodbye. So what did you learn about the church family? It involves all of us. It involves the young, it involves the old. It involves staff members, it involves people who work completely elsewhere and can only be here once or twice a week. It involves our time and our talent and our treasure all in because we don't just love this world. We love the world to come. And we don't just see, see Jesus as a Savior. We actually also submit to him as our Lord. And we look at the ministry of the church, and even as you heard plugged this morning, there are needs, brothers and sisters, in our church family for something with Wednesday night, maybe serving with Awana, for, for volunteering when we do family meals, for helping, and even right now with sweet sisters and brothers who watch some of your children so that the rest of you can hear the gospel. Or maybe during growth hour who rotate in and out, even between classes and serving there because they want to minister to people in our midst. 
So I don't, want, I don't need to give any, any guilt or pressure. That doesn't, that's not even healthy. All I can say is, thus saith the Lord. And how will you, disciples of Jesus, respond? Because ministry needs the church just as the church needs ministry. We're going to sing and praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But before we do, let me close us in prayer. Father, thank you for the gospel that, that, that is not just what we believe, putting our faith in Jesus Christ, but it's, it's a lens to see the world, how Christ, you served us, the King served us, and both command and invite us to serve you as part of our worship. Father, help us to be a church that looks more and more like Ephesians 4.12, that the people do the work of ministry. The saints serve. Lord, we want our newcomers or visitors or those who aren't even believers just to be fed. But Lord, maybe like Mr. Brood, shake us on the shoulder and ask us if we plan to eat today and how we plan to help in the preparation. Thank you for your word, which touches on all these topics. And even in this closing of 2 Timothy reminds us of the beauty of Christian ministry in the church. Receive this song as our praise in response to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.